Hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jim. Today's going to be episode 227 and we're going to be interviewing Wyatt. How you doing, Wyatt? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited to do this. I'm going to talk about your life and then also you've got your own nonprofit and podcast we're going to chat about a little later. So I think this is going to be a great interview. So, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So first question. Tell me about your childhood and growing up. How was that? Well, uh, looking back on it, you know, when you're raised in an environment, you don't, you don't know whether it's good or bad until, you know, you grow up and you look at it. And, but you know, my childhood was, uh, I guess I would say like anybody else's, but now looking back on it, 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 it really, really wasn't. My parents worked. Um, we, uh, grew up in a neighborhood in East side Stockton, uh, that was kind of rough. You know, I had a, my dad never used a drink, uh, and my mom didn't either while they were married. And so my childhood was, I guess you could say, you know, just like any typical 70s, 80s type of uh, childhood would be, you know, nothing really dysfunctional. And until I, um, you know, in, until uh, I guess you could say that the great divorce came. Um, oh, boy. How old yeah. were you? I was uh, I was 12 years old. And this kind of where, you know, my life kind of took a, you know, another another direction, I would say. Yeah, I know divorce is hard on children. My parents divorced when I was eight. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I, you know, again, I don't have, you know, I, I do have the only recollection I really have is, you know, uh, going to school. I know I wasn't, I, uh, I probably about up until the third or fourth grade, I, you know, couldn't barely read and write. And I know that, you know, I had a, I had an issue with school because I never felt smart enough or, you know what I mean? Um, uh, accepted you know everybody else was way ahead of me and and so i kind of seen you know realized now there was some you know maybe behavioral issues you know i kind of maybe acted out a little bit but you know uh you know typical stuff typical stuff that you know like we deal with in school how would you act out <clears throat> uh you know just you, you know that that typical thing you know when when teacher asks you a question you don't know the answer so you're gonna you know, act out and try to divert the attention so you don't have to answer it and, you know, look stupid because, you know, I, I remember just sitting there and just, it, it was like peanuts, you know, like, rah, 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 rah. I just, I never was able to, you know, take much in. And, and, and so I just felt out of place, you know, like I didn't belong. And, uh, and to be honest, I hated school. I guess you could say I hated school. Yeah, I was, I was not a fan of school, especially as I got older. I, I definitely, especially when I, well, I mean, there were I did have some good times in school, but I also had a lot of bad times also that I remember. And, and you know, it, typical, you know, playing and, you know, I played, they allowed me to play sports until, you know, kind of grades were, were you know, uh, used to whether you could play or not. And then I guess you could say I stopped because <laughs> that was the hard thing to, you know, that C average, it was me, was for like a, you know, an honor roll student to keep a 4.0 just for me to get, you know, a, a C in something was, it, it seemed like it took everything. Yeah. So. So you said your parents, they never drank or did any type of drugs, but well, you mentioned, you said not until they got divorced. Not, mom- you know, not, not until they got divorced. Uh, my dad never did. You know, the, the more I look back on it now, you know, uh, I don't know if it was because he was a young man, but you know, and how he was raised, but it, he had, uh, uh, you know, he's a really jealous guy. I never let my mom go anywhere and didn't allow my mom to do a lot of stuff. And, you know, when they got a divorce, I just remember my mom just like cutting loose. You know what I mean? It was, it was, I guess her time to shine. And, you know, so, so, so I wouldn't say mom was out of the picture, but mom was, you know, she was having her time, you know, she was catching up on a lot of things that she couldn't do. And dad well, was she, too. She was partying and stuff. Oh Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it went from, you know, it was, it was quite a transition I would say. Cause it, you know, I, I woke up one, I woke up one day with my mom and dad. And the next day I woke up with, uh, uh, my dad standing there introducing us to our new mom. And, uh, you know, uh, first thing he said is, Hey, we're going to the ocean. And, you know, as a 12 year old kid, I've never been to the ocean before. I didn't even think about the mom situation. I just jumped in the truck and I remember I had the stepbrother and stepsister that, that were there and it was kind of weird, but you know, Hey, we were going camping and you know what I mean? Again, distracted, you know, and I remember about two or three days later thinking, where's my mom at? You know what I mean? What this, the, I don't know, something about this ain't right, but, and that's kind of how, it, how it, you know, began the, the, the kind of dysfunction of, of, 
you know, being raised in a, in a divorced family, especially with my mom, you know, out, you know, doing what she wanted to do. And, and she was a good mom. Don't get me wrong. She took care of us, but the dysfunction of us moving around everywhere. I remember that's when I started, you know, uh, being sent to live with people, you know, like, uh, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, you know, in between mom and dad. And, uh, I re remember that's kind of where I started learning how to manipulate because at 12 or 13, I think I started smoking weed a little bit and uh, hanging around with people I wasn't supposed to hang around with. And who introduced and, you, know, you to weed? Uh, my cousin did. Okay. Yeah. My cousin introduced me to weed. I remember smoking it, really liking it. Um, how did it make you feel? Oh man, it made me feel great. You know, um, it made me feel great and bad at the same time because uh, that was something that my dad was really adamant about using drugs because the area where we lived and he grew up, you know, uh, a lot of drug addicts and a lot of people that partied. And he was like one in a million there. He was like the golden goose that never did. And so, so I guess it made me feel good and bad. Good that it made me feel good because I was feeling bad, but bad because I knew I shouldn't have been doing it. And for some reason, you know, that stigma that, you know, he used to teach us that, you know, when you do drugs, it, you know, kind of like that old movie, if you've seen, uh, forgot what it's called, but that one old movie about weed, you know, when you do it, you start killing people and stuff. And you know what I mean? And so I remember, Hey man, I'm oh, talking about reefer madness, reefer madness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember not doing anything crazy. And I remember I, I liked it. It wasn't as, you know, as, as crazy as what it was told to me. And, uh, so I guess there was guilt and a, a feeling of, of relief. Relief from all the pain you were feeling. Kind of, you know, um, you know, you don't really look at that stuff until you get a lot, a lot of older. And if you've been through the program and you've done your four step and all these all these good, uh, you know, things of, I guess, peeling the, uh, the layers of the onion, you don't realize it until you get older, you know, of what you were doing back then. And I guess it was something to fill the void. So uh, you weed was the first thing you were introduced to. When was the next time you were introduced to something? Actually, you know, I was introduced to marijuana. I was introduced to it at 12 or 13. I can't remember right, but I know it was my eighth grade summer going to my freshman year. And when I was introduced to it, believe it or not, um, I wish I can say it was a, only a recreational thing, but it seemed like uh, now that I look back on it, we were smoking almost every day, every other day. Uh, we were finding a time to where it went from my cousin now i'm i'm smoking you know it's it's funny how when you get in that circle then you find out who all smokes weed you know what i mean and yeah you also next thing you know together. yeah and going to high school we smoked weed almost every every day every morning you know and it became you know uh, um i guess you could say the thing so did you do any other drugs in high school you know, there was a time when I was 14, I was a freshman in high school that I did, uh, I did some methamphetamine and, um, you know, I liked it. I really liked it, but it wasn't something like the weed. I didn't pick it up every day, but I really, I remember really liking it and doing it maybe a few different times when I was 14, a few different times, you know, when I was 15, maybe a time or two when I was 16, but when I was uh, 17 and 18, that's when, uh, the methamphetamine started coming into my life and, um, really, uh, I guess you could say affecting it in the things I did. How was it affecting you? Well, it was affecting me by just, you know, uh, not only the people I hung out with, but just it, it affected my, my goals in life. It affected ev everything. It affected, you know, the, the career, I guess you could say path that, that I was on, uh, you know, I, I, I remember at 17, you know, I had, I had an option. I got, I got ran over when I was 14 and, um, and I think it was for at 14. I really, I, even though I started smoking weed a little bit before that, I got ran over at 14 and I remember being in the hospital and my, uh, my dad and my sisters all coming up and, and telling me they were getting ready to go to Disneyland. Right. And I'm in a full body cast and I remember just getting a resentment, you know, I look back on it now and I thought, wow, you know, I really didn't start going sideways until that day. But after that day, it, it was like, it was, I was really good at finding the worst crowd to hang out with. You know what I mean? Whether it be high school and anywhere I moved, it just seemed like I, I uh, the people that used or there were bad, you know, we consider the bad kids. I would, I would find them immediately and everywhere I moved, whether it would be Oregon, um, you know, in the mountains with my aunt and uncle, 
you know, with my mom, wherever she moved in town, it, it seemed like it, I would always find them or I'd go back to my, you know, my, my old town and hang out there. And so uh, I guess you could say the direction, you know, uh, I didn't have no, I didn't have no purpose and I didn't have no passion right about 16 or 17. And I remember when I started using meth about 17 and uh, even though I had people around me that would try to encourage me and, you know, try to give me direction to life and, you know, um, help me to, uh, I guess, get some purpose and calling, help me to do a career, you know, go to school, all these different things. I remember just kind of like fell at the wayside because I wasn't interested. What I was interested in was is going out and causing trouble and, you know, uh, being around uh, the likes of uh, people just like me that were, you know, strung out, I guess you could say. So I would say 17. I was I was probably at the point where a lot of people didn't know, but I was probably I was probably using meth every day. And at 18, because I quit high school at about uh, the beginning of my senior year. And, you dropped uh, out? Yeah, I dropped out. Uh, <laughs> probably the worst thing in my life that could have ever happened to me is uh, I got a settlement from that wreck when I was 14, and it was given to me when I was 18. And I was handed $48,000 in the middle of my my meth addiction. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> needless, to, needless to say, no, no one's seen me for about three or four months. And, uh, you know, it, it it beat me up. I remember at the end of three or four, I think it was four months later, I was walking down uh, the street in uh, on the east side there. They call it Oakieville. And I was walking down the street with a backpack and two different pair of shoes on and flat broke. Unbelievable. Strung out. Strung out. The only thing I got from it was a severe addiction, I guess you could say. Unbelievable. And then, uh, yeah. And then two months later started my career in, uh, I guess you could say, the penal system. Oh, that sounds like it's fun. Let's get into that in yeah. just a second. But um, stupid question. What does meth make you feel like? How did, how did it make you feel? Meth made me feel invincible. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you know, kind of like alcohol. When people, you know, drink alcohol, they're able to talk. They're able to socialize. They're able to do those things. That's what meth actually made me feel like I can do. Meth made me feel like, uh, believe it or not, I, I know this sounds stupid, but it made me feel smarter. You yeah. know, again, you know, I told you I had issues, you know, with learning and different things, you know, at, at an early age. And it made me feel smarter, made me feel like I can uh, talk to people, made me feel, you know, invincible, made me feel like I can do the things that I didn't do before. Uh, yeah, just really, really good. Yeah, I remember when I took Adderall, um, yeah. it would feel kind of the same way. I would snort a lot of it, a lot of it, because the only difference is methamphetamine has methyl in it as far as like the compounds, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know a lot about that stuff. But I know they're very similar and they're both amphetamine. One's just, like I said, one chemical or compound away from another. But yeah, I mean, I, I I look back, I was just talking to my mom the other day about how crazy we are as drug addicts, how I would snort so much Adderall that my body would be like, I, it would be my heart rate would be crazy. I would just be like giving off like, a, like just a certain feeling. And my solution was, let me snort some Klonopin. <laughs> and yeah. then we dr let me drink a couple of beers, have a couple of shots, and that'll bring me down. Yep. And I think back about how dangerous that was. That's just oh, if man. anyone told me they did it, I would say you're nuts. Yeah. I but tell people us, now. Yeah, I tell people now when we mix an upper and a downer, we get an all arounder. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what happens. And I did the same thing, you know, smoked weed after a bunch of days. And it was just, you know, it is it, crazy the things that we do when we look back on now and we go, I don't even know how I survived that. Yeah. And, and you mentioned another thing I was going to bring up is you mentioned that no matter where you moved, you seem to find the wrong crowd. Absolutely. And it's so true. Isn't it amazing how we just attract it? There's something about it that happens. You know, I my dad used to tell me I'm tired of people being a bad influence on you. But the truth was. I always influence people, you know, it's not that I was attracted, but. It seemed, you're right, whether it was school, I was always, you know what I mean, attracted to the people, you know, it's like we knew who 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 smoked weed or we knew who did the drugs, you know what I mean? It was like, uh, you know, a gut feeling. And so, yeah, every time, every 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 place I ever moved to, which was a lot of places, I always found a, a few people or I found the crowd that I was able to do those things with. Yeah. So... You graduate high school. You're broke. Well, you don't. I'm sorry. You don't graduate no. high school. You're broke, <laughs> walking down the street, strung yeah. out after losing forty eight thousand dollars. What did you do at that point? Where was your life going? What What did you do? Um, 
you know, it's it's like a good and bad. You know, at 19, um, I think I was able to, I moved in with my dad at about 19. And I was still using, and I met a girl, uh, you know, did met the girl thing and, you know, uh, got her pregnant, did the little family thing, had a daughter, my daughter, Sam. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't get the monkey off my back. Um, I, you know, it, it was trying to, you know, live two lives. I have, I have them in this apartment trying to go to work every day, but I'm, I'm still strung out. I never, I, now that I look back on it, I don't think I ever got clean. I just got, you know, I just kind of changed direction and just started doing the responsible thing. You know, for a year there, I was out on the streets just doing whatever I wanted. I remember moving back into Lodi with my dad and, you know, I had kind of a more of a stable living. And from there, you know, that stable living kind of like transferred over to, to, you know, the apartment that she was able to rent and, you know, where I had my, my daughter at. And then, um, and then I think six months after she was born was my first term. I went to, uh, I, uh, had a, got a second degree burglary. I was out uh, doing my thing and I got a second degree burglary and I went to jail. I think that was my second time, but that was my first time actually getting a lot, you know, an amount of time. So you also mentioned that was um, right around the time you started your penal career. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was kind of the, the start of everything, you know, uh, even having a kid and, and, and the prospects of being a dad and stuff didn't, didn't, didn't overtake the addiction. You know, that was still, you know, um, uh, a, a big part of me, I guess you could say. And I, I still had, you know, a longing to use. And, you know, that's the truth. The more I look back on it, I, I wish it wasn't the truth, but but it was the truth. I just wasn't ready yet. And uh, that was my my first big, you know, sentence. I think I was sentenced to a year. And then from there, you know, I got out and obviously, you know, uh, kid's mom wouldn't take me back and. You know, I I don't know if it was a deep depression or just a deep addiction. I could I could tell you it was both. I wasn't happy. You know, I was I, jailed I, for that year. Uh well, you know, I, I wish I can say it was bad, but if it was it was too bad, I don't think I would have went back. I think it was, you know, again, there you find your community of people. You know what I mean? Everybody that I knew on the streets that were addicted, most of them were there, you know. And so it's it's just like creating a a family out here, you know, a click out here of your friends that use just this the same way in jail. And, you know, I, I guess it was bad in the sense where I couldn't go nowhere, but it wasn't bad in the sense to where um, I never wanted to go back, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, the, I mean, many. <laughs> I mean, some people, like you said, they don't mind going into that jail. It's just, especially when you're uh, know everybody there, it makes it that much harder. Did you, yeah. were you, were you able to get drugs when you were there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The, you know, when I was in County jail and I went out to the honor farm, there was, there was, uh, there was drugs, weed everywhere. And so, you know, uh, the excitement about just, you know, clicking up and just, you know, being in that, that criminal, you know, mindset, I don't know, maybe, maybe I kind of feel now I look back on it that, you know, that lifestyle may have excited me. I don't know. You know, I know that it didn't bug me and I know that, you know, uh, most of the time I spent in jail, even though I was sad and I missed my family, I guess I was more happier to be there in, in an environment where I understood people. So you find you found yourself relating to others. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. You Definitely. guys talk you guys talk a lot about your problems and stuff? You know, not really. Uh maybe a little bit, you know. Um and in, in, you know, I, there was a few good things. I did get my GED while I was there, so I guess that's, that's good. A, a good thing. Uh, but no, not not really that first uh, that first jail sentence I did. So, what do you do after you uh, get out of jail for that first year? Um, man, I went I straight back into my using. Straight um, back. I went. Yeah, I think I went tried to work it out didn't work out with my kid's mother um she went straight back to using you know would have a job here or there but i just i couldn't you know um i couldn't shake uh i just couldn't shake it you know and so next thing i know i'm i guess you could say homeless you know i i it's hard to describe homeless i didn't have nowhere to live but you know what i mean i've always learned how to you know come up with some type of hustle on the streets. And so, you know, I, I look at it sometimes and go, you know what? I wasn't pushing a shopping cart and, you know, I might've slept in a few tents or two, but 
you know, I wasn't that, you know, uh, that homeless person you would see pushing a shopping cart down the street. I was that homeless person that was jumping from, you know, garage to garage to house to house to city to city and, uh, you know, being like a chameleon and, 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 you know, learning how to survive in that environment. And, you know, I did well for a while, believe it or not. And I know it sounds bad. I was doing bad, but I was in a sense doing well because obviously I was doing well enough to not want to change. Yeah. So at this time you have a family, did you do anything to support them? How, how was, no. how did that go? You know, um, no, I, you know, my own abilities at that time, I couldn't even really support myself. Uh, you know, during those times I stole, you know, part of my hustle was, you know, out there stealing, um, daily, not just a little bit like to get by, but, you know, it was not only a hustle, but I, I think that too turned into addiction, turned into uh, an, what addiction. kind of stuff would you steal? Ah, uh, man, you know what? I, I laugh at people and I, I read about catalytic converters today because <laughs> 20 years ago, I guess you could say, uh, you know, we were doing that. We were still in cars. Uh, I think anything, you know, um, nothing shy of what anything that wasn't nailed or screwed down, you know what I mean? We would take, so. Did you ever have any type of regular employment? You know, um, not really. You know, I would work for somebody for a day for cash or work for them for a week for cash. But I never had really no – in between that time, I never really had no stable employment to where I, – I remember on my whole 20s, I don't remember a time where I had this idea of getting a house or getting, you know, getting responsible and getting a job. All the Every time that I would get a job is because the opportunity came up and they were paying cash and I needed cash, you know what I mean, uh, to, you know, feed my habit. You know, half of my 20s, you know, after I went to jail for a year – it was another year and a half. I got another year. And then, you know, two years after that, another year, then I started going to prison. And then, you know, just, you know, 15 years of my life was just in and out, you know, uh, of jail and prison and, and programs. And I, you know, I, I, I forget to tell you this, but back in the day when they give you, they catch you with any drugs, they'd give you prop 36. And so what's prop 36? That, prop 36 in the state of California is, uh, when you're, you're, you're caught with any uh, drugs, you know, uh, paraphernalia, they'd give you Prop 36 and they'd make you get like, go to a program. And so usually when I got busted for something, you know, and they knew I was on drugs, that every, you know, it was just a known fact, uh, especially in my neighborhood around. And so, you know, they'd sentence me to a program, you know, and I'd go and do a program and I'm, I'm honest, I'll be 100% honest. I never ever went to a program in my early 20s or my 20s and I went to three or four of them with the intent of getting clean and sober I always went because it was an alternative sentencing and they fed better you know so what you could you do more stuff at a program you, it, you wasn't really locked up you'd go out you know and and so that that that's the honest truth I never went with the intent to to get clean and sober I went with the intent of it being an alternative sentencing and they, they fed better there so what did you do to land yourself in jail the second time? The second time uh, was a 10851, taking a vehicle without consent, basically, you know, stealing a car and uh, drug possession and and uh, a few other things that they charged me with. What were you going to sell the car to make money? No, I was just driving it around just because I had it, you know, had stolen it. And I had it for like a month before they really caught me with it, but. That's just the insanity of the disease, you know what I mean? <laughs> Basically, it was just a long joy ride. Yeah, you know, and I'd use it to go steal other stuff. You know, that was, you know, part of the addiction. You know, however, I, I can get around to do whatever I needed to do to, you know, support my habit. What kind of other stuff would you steal? Man, I've been, you know, I, I've i been caught up in so much, so many different, you know what I mean? I guess you could say hustles, but... You know, if you've ever, if you ever lived that lifestyle, you know, there's, there's things that come every day, you know, different types of hustles, check fraud, uh, you know, uh, store fraud receipt. I mean, you know, I think I've done it all. I think I've gotten a felony for almost every, you know, uh, category that there is. So, but, so I used to do, I guess, everything that, you know what I mean? That you could hustle up some money with. So what happens when you leave jail the second time? Did you have any plans? I mean, 
That's one thing I don't, I I think that's stupid about jail is they just let you out with no plans. Like they don't try to sit down with you and plan out well, what the hell are you going to do when you place that first step outside the prison walls and you're a free man. I think the second time I did do I was doing a year out of the county and I did do a SAP program and you know what's that? Uh, what's a SAP program? It's a substance abuse program and they called it an early release. I got into it because they said it's an early release, meaning that it took time off your sentence and you know we're all trying to get out. <laughs> so yeah. I did that and I remember for a couple months I was doing pretty good, didn't really use in there or nothing and 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 kind of had some high hopes, man. But you know the day I was let out, you know. Um, I remember I'd go stay with my dad or my mom for the first couple of weeks. And then I'd just be drawn back out into that lifestyle again. It wouldn't last long. You know, the hopes and the dreams wouldn't last uh, as long as the cravings would. Yeah. So at what point in your life did you start seeking recovery? I actually, uh, I went to Delancey street. It's a two year program in 2000 and five and that's uh, a long program two years yeah man i almost have i have about four and a half years of just programs under my belt in the last fit but delancey street was two years i've been in a few you know six eight month programs and stuff and so uh but yeah it was a long program there and they you know they they do more of uh what they call you know work therapy attack therapy and and and, and well let me rephrase that maybe not attack therapy but you know, when I was there, they would do a lot of games and confront you on your behavior and, um, you know, and teach you how to work, which was good for me. You know, I worked in the restaurant down there and did did really great and uh, had two years of sobriety when I left there at my two year mark. And then I moved into my own place was my I guess you could say my first actual apartment. And um, man, I was doing good for for about eight months. But even then I had never worked a program, didn't have a, you know, didn't work the steps or nothing. It was just basically a white knuckle staying sober. You know what I mean? And, uh, it about eight months went by and I went and visited a friend in my old neighborhood. And, uh, I was actually talking to them about sobriety, not recovery, but I was talking about, you know, I got an apartment and all this. And I remember sitting in the garage and the pipe was going around and next thing you know, um, man, I took a hit and I had been clean two years, eight months. And, uh, and here's how insane it was. Uh, as soon as I took a hit, I knew right right then and there that I was going back to prison, right immediately. And 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 here's the truth. I didn't even go back home to my apartment. I had like three three weeks left on my, I had just paid rent. And uh, as soon as I took that hit, I had my truck at, out in the parking lot that I had paid for. I'd saved up money, you know, working and I had bought a little truck. And uh, it was sitting out in the parking lot and after I took that hit and I knew that I was going back to prison, I didn't even go back home. I called, didn't go back to work, called my uh, my brother-in-law who I was working with at the time and, uh, you know, told them that, you know, I broke my, my finger or did something. But it was it was just like a, it was an instant, instantly back. I was instantly back and I wasn't back yet, but I was instantly back into that same place that uh where i left off and and i still had three weeks left on my rent i still had a job and i still had a vehicle and i uh about a week later everything was was uh was gone i had already sold it and you know what i mean went back into that mode and um and i went back to prison four months after that for what i went back to prison for uh attempted grand theft and grand theft attempted and grand theft <laughs> was this a joyride again or did you use uh, the attempted from... well yeah i went back to doing the catalytic converter thing and and i had somebody uh um you know come up on us and you know i wasn't about to go to jail so you know i always take him on a run and that's kind of what i did and, and um you know they took some pictures in the parking lot and they had pictures through the window and it was me so uh when i was picked up uh, I had been, I was pulled over actually in a legal car. I was pulled over and I was a, the, the passenger in a car and, um, or no, wait, I'm sorry. I was actually inside of a tow truck trying to steal it and they caught me. That's, that's what happened. The passenger in the car was the time before I was in a tow truck in Turlock trying to steal a tow truck. I don't, I don't even know how to, it was a class A big go. It was a big tow truck that towed the big diesels and, uh, I was laying inside the seat and I didn't know that they had called or seen me in there. And so that was kind of a, you know, my run was, was stopped on that day. And then that's when I got charged with the, uh, 
that was the attempted grand theft and the grand theft was for the Cadillac converter. So, yeah. And did that land you back in jail again? Yeah. That, yeah. That sent me back to prison again. Yes. Yeah. What's the longest length of time you've done? Like longest in. I would say the longest, you know, even Delancey street was a program, but I was in jail for almost eight months before I went there. So, I was probably locked up for two years, eight months, but the longest stretch I think I did was uh, 14 months. I mean, it's not too long, but that's a long, I mean, for me, 14 months is a long time. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, it, anytime, anytime in yeah. prison is a long time. Yeah. You know, I, I wish to say that, you know what I mean? I was a violent criminal, but I really wasn't, man. I was just a dope fiend criminal. You know what I mean? Everything I ever did was just steal stuff. It was, it was petty. And so, you know, all my charges always carried like 16, two or three, you know, sometimes I'd get, you know, uh, get lucky from the judge. And, and even though I had a prior, he'd still give me just 16 months and, and, you know, you serve eight months on, on 16 months and then the county time and I'd get in trouble in prison or whatever. And so, you know, uh, having four or five stretches of a year, 16 months, you know, nine months, all that stuff adds up. So, <laughs> So what do you do after you get out of prison again? Are you, what, you know, what point did you get sober? You know, I was, I was leaving prison in Jamestown, California. I was leaving from Sierra, uh, uh conservation, uh, corpse. It's a prison called Jamestown up here in California. And I was leaving on the bus, man. And they had gave me the gate money and I had to buy some clothes to dress out in. Cause I had no clothes, obviously. And I remember sitting on the bus and I remember looking at this $169 and I was, my first thought, even after being locked up for 14 months and that during that time, a bunch of things happened in prison for me uh, that kind of turned me away from, you know, the lifestyle, the prison lifestyle and, and, and what we did there and the things that happened. And I remember looking down and I had this money and all I could think about was going to my connect's house, you know, and the truth was, I didn't even know if he lived there still, but all I could think about was that. And um, man, that scared me to death because, you know, when you're a drug addict, $169 ain't going to last you, but you know, a day or two. And so I, I asked myself, what are you going to do after that? You know what I mean? And to be honest, man, I, I, I didn't really want to go back to prison again. You know, that last uh, term I did, I really, I kind of seen prison for what it was. And I, you know, I just wasn't about that business more. Maybe it was cause I was getting older and, you know, and uh, wanted to do something different, but I knew that I, something had to happen. And so I, what I, what I did is what I don't, didn't do usually is, um, I went to my, I went to my sister's house and, uh, and, and I stayed the other night and I had my sister take me to my pro officer's house in the morning. And, and, you know, we, anytime you leave prison, you got to go check in. And, um, actually there, I asked him if he can get me a program and he did, he got me into Salvation Army and I went there for two weeks and I blew it because, you know, they started Kind of, I, I felt they were talking bad to me. So I left, man. And I left and I walked straight to the phone and I called him again. He goes, what'd you do? I said, man, I, you know, they were told me to, to do this. And I, you know what I mean? I, I wasn't really about just them telling me that at that point in my life. And so he came and got me, man. And he took me to no, another program um, called New Directions. And I remember standing there on that phone that day. I had 16 bucks left from Salvation Army, man. And I was on, I was on the strip and I knew exactly where the, you know, where the houses were and, and that was kind of a hard, tough time to me, too, because I felt like a failure because I just left this program. And and uh, man, he came and picked me up. He swooped me up and he took me to another program called New Directions, man. And um, and and I had a great support system there. I wanted to change. I didn't know how to change. That's that's the truth of the matter. I really didn't know how to change. I wanted to change. Um, and there I was able to have a great support system that helped kind of help me transition into recovery mode. I don't and, think uh, people know how important a supportive group can be because absolutely. that understand us. Yeah. And, you know, uh, that was my first time really, you know, you know engaging in, 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 in meetings in, in the program. And, and uh, I actually, there was a, there was a man there named David Hanley. He uh, was a project coordinator, but he was also the pastor of a church out there. And so uh, it was my, my first experience of working the steps and not even know I was working the steps because you know, uh, I kind of still had a little chip on my shoulder then. I didn't know at what, but, you know, he would take, he would allow me to come in and, and talk to him. And, and I guess, uh, you know, through that process, I, I started being able to trust and, 
and and I guess you could say unpack a lot of things, you know. And he had his own little program uh, that he did. It was called Twelve Steps to the Cross. And so in between the meetings and the program and 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 the the main program classes and stuff. I would go and attend that and uh you know he'd he'd break these things down to me that I never knew and you know he was the first one to allow me to see how dysfunctional my life was and I think right then when I got that understanding that my life had been a mess you know I I started to become accountable for it and once you found yourself being accountable what did you do to better yourself you know here I my first plan of action, I, I wish I can say it was this and this, but here's what I did. I did what was suggested of me. I didn't really know what to do, but I had a friend that I had known on the streets. His name was Tyson, and he uh, uh, had been through that program, and they allowed alumni to come back and, you know, to talk with people that are in the program. And uh, and I remember that being an overwhelming. What do I do? How do I do it? And I remember him telling me, man, listen, all, all you do is just do what you're doing, man. And matter of fact, he goes, uh, can you help me? put up the church chairs on Sunday. I said, I, uh, all right. You know what I mean? And and so him inviting me to do that in the meetings gave me a little bit of a purpose, right? Because he would always call me and say, Hey, don't forget to set up the chairs Sunday. And we would get there about four in the morning. And again, then I'd have somebody else to talk to and work through, you know, things in the steps. And so, you know, I guess you could say a, a major part of my of my story are these guys that took me in and gave me these little, you know, uh, little tasks, you know what I mean? That were very important, even though I had went and moved into a sober living house and I had gotten a job with my uncle, I still would stay involved. You know, that Sunday morning doing the chairs was like, you know, the biggest responsibility that I can ever have. And, you know, I started doing that while I was in the program. I started doing these little bitty things that were suggested of me and I became and I became consistent, I guess you could say. Instead of wanting to run out and change the world, I, I remember just taking suggestion and being consistent and just sticking around. Yeah. So what was the process of you getting sober? Uh the process. <laughs> You know, the process of me getting sober was 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 realizing that um, first and foremost was realizing that, you know, how much I was hurting my family. I had a kid that was already 12 years old. Um, and and the, the process of it was me, you know. Really, I guess you could say working the steps, you know, finding someone that that was able to take me to the steps and attending uh, and attending church for me. That was my re that was my recovery program. And I, and that's what I stayed consistent with. And through that process, I was able to unpack a lot of stuff and, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't say get well, but get healed over with, of a lot of things and, and, and see, you know, how a lot of things had, had hindered me in my addiction. So what's life like for you nowadays that you're sober? Well, it's, it's nothing like I ever thought, you know, uh, I used to just dream of, uh, you know, having a wife and a white picket fence and even a little house to rent. And, you know, this may sound funny, but I used to, I used to dream of having two pillows because, you know, a lot of, a lot of times in my life, I only had one when you're locked up, they don't give you one. And so I used to say, man, I'm gonna get as many pillows on my bed as I can when I get my own house or my own room. And so I had this, uh, this outlook that as soon as I get married and have this little house and a nice little job and, and, um, you know, wife, man, you know, uh, I'll be happy, but I guess you could say God had a lot of other things in store for me because, you know, once I got that about a year out of recovery, I got married and we moved into her little house and, you know, I was staying consistent, you know, uh, of doing what I've always done, you know, uh, the chair story, just to let you guys know, I did that for four years. I, I went in every Sunday morning and helped them stack the chairs, even, even, uh, you know, after I went to Bible college, College and got ordained i'd still go stack the chairs it became my responsibility and it was hard to even hand it off but i just stayed consistent you know those first couple of years i you know went back to work stayed in the stayed in the program um step kept working on my recovery um and uh man it, there was just so much things added to my life you know um i went back to school in 2013 i had about four years of recovery and um, I went back to school to become a substance abuse counselor, 
which was scary in, in itself because you remember if you hear my story about school man i'm never felt really smart enough to even you know uh think of that as an option man and i went back and i you know for me i i was constantly breaking barriers that i thought you know that i wasn't good enough for and i went back to school uh got my credential uh went to work for the same program new directions that was my first uh substance abuse job and uh you know, I had this dream in my heart that, you know, to go and create a, a a treatment program too. And so I remember telling everybody there, I'd been working there for like eight or nine months. And I said, Hey, we're going to, I'm going to help a guy start a treatment program up in the hills. And everybody started laughing at me, you know, because I don't know if, if it's because I only had a little bit of time and, you know, dreamers are dreamers. We, we get that. But uh, I had met a gentleman. I drove my car, uh, me and my wife had drove my car all the way about 70 miles from where we lived. And had looked at the place to do a program and the lady there said hey uh, i know a gentleman that that actually wants to start a program would you mind if i give him your number and i said sure and uh, about the time i got back home he called me and uh that dream that we had turned into actual reality uh seven months later turning point of arnold was uh was opened and it's a treatment center uh here in arnold california an inpatient you know 30 60 90 day treatment center and uh we hit me and my wife helped to put it together and uh, establish that and, and and it's huge it's a huge thing to to be a part of something like that look back on your life and go oh my god here's look what i'm doing now you know i uh currently i'm the program director my wife went and got her substance abuse uh certification three years ago her name's rebecca and we both worked there we're the only counselors there i'm the program director also and you know we this is what we do daily i i think i realized about five years in my recovery um if I don't work with people and I don't give it away, it might be dangerous for me in my life. You know, I tell people that if I didn't probably do what I do now, I probably would be back out there. Yeah, we got absolutely. I mean, we have to do things as preventative measures for keeping us from going yeah. back out there. Yeah. And so, you know, through the, through the process last, I've been clean and sober 15 years since 2008 and man, you know, uh, we've moved a couple of times. I, I got my substance abuse certification, uh, was able to, you know, work at a few different places. I've worked at the county up here, uh, was getting ready to get hired at Jamestown Prison, the prison I left in 2008. But I decided to take another job, which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, amazing in and of itself, you know. And uh, during that process, you know, me and my wife have been able to, you know, pour into a lot of people. I became a, a, a senior pastor here at our local church about three years ago. And so, you know, uh, me and my wife are pastors at a church. Uh, we help run this substance abuse facility. Uh, you know, we've developed we've developed a a uh, a nonprofit called Mother Load Relief and Assistance Center. And we haven't again, we haven't really done anything with it since COVID. But we plan on maybe uh, you know starting that back up too. But it was a nonprofit where we help people get into treatment. Um, you know, right now we're starting our other business called Rise and Walk Recovery. We have another. We have a podcast, Rise and Walk Recovery Podcast, where we, you know, we, we like to talk about, share our experience, experience, strength, and hope. We like to talk about, you know, uh, different things about addiction. We like to educate people. And so, man, we've we've come a long ways. I look back on it now, man, and, and it, I've come a long ways, you know, uh, since when I got clean and sober. Yeah. So do you have any, because we're getting towards the end here, do you have any tips or tricks for people that are listening right now? Yeah, I do. You know, um, this is just a suggestion. We always suggest in the program, you know, uh, but I do have some tips. If anybody's in early recovery, man, I just I just ask that you stick with it, even if you don't understand or don't know. And even if you don't like it, stick with it. You know, I always say uh, he who stays consistent wins. And we know that if if, you know, we're sober today and we have gratitude, it, it'll bring tomorrow sobriety, too. And I just, you know, just want to throw that to anybody out there that's struggling, you know, maybe in their program and maybe dealing with a lot of feelings they never dealt with. I always tell them, listen, these feelings don't last long. This too shall pass and uh, get a sponsor and work the steps. Listen, if we don't get a sponsor, we work the steps tonight Then I feel that our, that our program is really is is really useless. You know, it's cool to go and and hang out and talk and stuff. But really, the the priority of the AA program, I feel. And any of the 12 step programs is it to actually work the steps, because if you're just going 
and you're, you know, not doing anything as far as working on yourself, then pretty soon you're going to start white knuckling it and, you know, things are going to happen in your sobriety. So I would just suggest that if you're in, in AA or NA or whatever anonymous you're in, uh, work the steps, find a sponsor, work the steps, and it'll, you'll see your life change. That's great, man. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to sit down and talk with us, especially giving us some tips and tricks. Absolutely. Sounds like you, I mean, like you mentioned, experience, strength, and hope. It seems like you have a, a lot of experience, a lot of strength, and yeah. you can give a lot of hope to a lot of people. Sounds like that's what you're trying to do. Absolutely. You know, the, we, we, you know, uh, we need more of us out there to, you know, to help people, you know, addictions running rampant, you know, and a lot of people are dying out there. And so, you know, I, I, I share with people, there's, there's something in everybody that somebody needs. And so don't, you know, you, you need to open your mouth and share your story. Yeah. It's amazing the power of sharing your story. Cause you know, you can just find that maybe even if it's only one person that can relate to it and go i'm not alone you know what i mean because a lot of us i I say that addiction is a lonely place to be very lonely because we all think we're different we go oh i have a problem but i'm not like you guys you know we don't want to ever admit that we're like other addicts we think oh i just have this and i can handle my problem whatever the case might be and at the end of the day we're just bullshitting ourselves absolutely and that's the truth yeah so did you have anything else that you want to throw in? Uh, well, actually, one more time, tell us the name of your podcast and how to find it. Uh, the name of our podcast is Rise and Walk Recovery. Uh, you can find me, Wyatt Trammell, on Facebook, and you can uh, request me, and I'll invite you to Rise and Walk Recovery. Our recovery is uh, our recovery page is where our podcast is, uh, is live on. We do a lot of podcasts because we like people to ask questions and stuff. But Rise and Walk Recovery. And you can also find us on Instagram and TikTok. Great. That's awesome. So it sounds like you guys are doing good things. You guys headed in the right direction. Absolutely. We're that's we're trying to head in the right direction. We're doing what we can. Day by day. Just got to do it day by day, right? Yep. So I once again want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Well, we, we appreciate it. We thank you too. Awesome, man. So sit tight for me. And for everyone that's watching and listening, if you like what you just saw and heard, go below and give us a like. Also, subscribe to see when we upload new videos. You can also check us out on all social media. We're on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I say you name it, we're probably on it. I also suggest checking out our website, which is www.addicts-anonymous.com. There you'll find plenty of free resources as well as free literature. Also, Addicts Anonymous has a book coming out. It's called Addicts Anonymous, Our Stories. It should be out in mid to late February. It's just a collection of essays that I've written on a number of different topics, as well as people's stories at the end where we collect the number of stories. So I'll keep you posted as far as when that's going to be available. That's all we have for today. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast. And until next time.